This episode of Youth Culture Matters is sponsored in part by Judson College. When Fern Nichols sent her two oldest sons off to junior high school, her heart was heavy knowing that they would be facing all kinds of challenges, choices, and temptations. Her concerns were shared by other mothers as they gathered to pray for their kids. This happened 40 years ago back in 1984. This was the beginning of Moms in Prayer International. Today, I'm chatting with two moms who are part of the Moms in Prayer ministry about how to pray for our kids as they navigate life in a changing youth culture on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Youth Culture Matters. I'm Walt Mueller here at the Center for Parent Youth Understanding in uh, beautiful Pennsylvania. Beautiful this time of year uh, as as we welcome fall, and we're going to have a conversation today. Uh, you can all listen in on this. I've got uh, f- actually there's going to be four of us on this call uh, on this uh, podcast who are all in Pennsylvania right now in various places. So it's fun to be able to talk with Pennsylvania friends, especially about something that relates. Uh, so much to youth ministry. As you heard in the introduction, we're going to have a conversation with a couple of friends who are very involved in the Moms in Prayer movement. But before we uh, introduce them and get talking to them, uh, I called in another friend who many of you who are youth workers know, Travis Deans. Travis seems to be everywhere these days on social media. And Travis, I've been watching your travel schedule as well. Um, You're racking up some miles, huh? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, Travis, I've known Travis for a long time. Travis, I would say if you ever want to network in youth ministry, Travis is the guy to call. He seems like he somehow has his fingers in everything and is really good at communicating with all of us about what's happening in the world of youth ministry, the resources that we can connect with, uh, as well as conferences and uh, you know, training events, things like that. So, Travis, welcome. I Thank you. You know, before before uh, I ask you a little question here, uh, just about your own school experience growing up, because that's what we're going to talk about here, I, I'm just curious, would you tell people who may not be familiar with you what it is you're doing now in terms of youth ministry, in particular National Network of Youth Ministries, your role with them, as well as the nine-month mission trip? Yeah, so... Uh... National Network of Youth Ministries is an organization that helps youth pastors and youth workers, youth leaders to connect with each other on the national level and, more importantly, on the local level. Uh, We really believe that uh, if you're in ministry, it's important to be connected and to not isolate yourself uh, because the more connected you are, the longer you'll last in ministry. And we believe the more effective you'll be in ministry. Uh, And uh, too many too many people burn out of ministry and, and end up leaving the ministry for for. Not so good reasons, but uh, being connected really helps you to stay in it for the long haul. And then uh, the other thing that I'm uh, involved in is something called Nine Month Mission Trip. We encourage students to uh, think of their school as, not as a place that they have to be, uh, but as a place where God has sent them, a place where God has put them uh, for a purpose and a reason uh, to impact the lives of others. And uh, we are sure grateful for those who pray for our schools and pray for the students in our schools. So <laughs> a little yeah. sneak peek. Later. Yeah, so that's good. And, and Travis, we appreciate you and everything you do. So um, I'm excited to, to see you at events that are coming up for sure. We, we, our paths cross from time to time. So that's an awesome thing. I, yeah. I want to ask you, Travis, you know, before we get chatting here with our guests, uh, just a little bit about, you know, I was thinking today as we're talking about prayer about my own school experience, which was, I'm guessing, long before yours, uh, chronologically speaking, dating. You don't have to shake your head yes like you're doing enthusiastically. Um, I understand why you're doing that. Um, but your own experience, as I was thinking about mine, you know, what, like, what was happening for you as you were growing up where you went to school? What was the school you went to, your, your high school or your district? 
Well, this this is my claim to fame right here. Is it Turkey uh, Foot? I, I went to Turkey Foot Valley Area High School. It's a real place. Yeah. It's a it's a public school. It's very small. Uh right on the border of Pennsylvania, Maryland, not far from West Virginia. Um Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's and that's one of our weird Pennsylvania <laughs> names, right? To Turkey Foot. So, I mean, that's a whole other podcast. But how how large was your graduating class? Thirty three. Thirty three people. Thirty three. That's yeah. amazing. So was... you were in a smaller district. I was in a a large district, which I'll share about in just a little bit. But um, when when you were going through school, was there any sense of you know folks praying for you or any? Uh, presence mm. in the school itself with like Bible clubs or, um, you know, some call them Christian clubs, that sort of thing. You know, what what were the influences on you at that point in time as you think back? Yeah. So, uh, I so I, I graduated in 1992. So it was you know pre internet, um, pre cell phones. Uh, so in some ways it was it was very different. You know, uh, uh, a, a different. Um, teenagers were just involved in different things. Other, you know, uh, a lot of different issues. But um, my my experience uh, in 1984, uh, the, there was a law that was passed that was called the Equal Access Act, and that law um, allowed for religious students to form religious clubs in public high schools as long as they were student initiated and student led. And so uh, when I was a freshman in high school, our, the teachers at my school went on strike. Uh, both of them just walked right out the door. Um, both teachers. <laughs> yeah, both of them. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> there were more than two. Yeah. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I finished my freshman year of high school uh, in homeschool. And uh, that was, you know, that was back when homeschool was still a weird thing. Um, Anyway, uh, so but I during that year I had been reading some missionary biographies and I just felt like God was calling me to go back to my high school as a missionary. Uh, you know, I'd been reading about William Carey and Amy Carmichael and Jim Elliott, people like that, and I just felt God speaking to my heart to be a missionary to my school. And so in 1989, uh, I, I went back to for my sophomore year. Uh, and started a prayer group that met in the mornings. Uh, we started a Bible club, which the Equal Access Act uh, provided uh, for. Uh, and it was funny because the even though it was a very small school, the principal at the school was not enthusiastic about a Bible club. He he did not love that idea at all. So do, he do asked, you know? Can he, I interrupt you there? Do you know what yeah. his fear was or his concern? Well, you know, separation of church and yeah. state. It was you know that whole mantra. Um, and so, and and the Equal Access Act was only five years old at that time. It was it was new, and it had not yet gone to the Supreme Court, which which it did in 1990 and was upheld by the Supreme Court. So, um, so the, our principal he says, uh, you, "You guys want to help students, you know, not drink or do drugs, things like that, right?" Like, well, I, I guess that's part of it. He goes, "Okay, here's what we're going to do. Instead of Bible Club, we're going to call this." The Drug and Alcohol Club. Now, who do you think shows up to the first meeting of the Drug and Alcohol Club? Uh, exactly the people <laughs> you want to reach. Well, that's true. Yeah. And but yeah. Uh, but they were they were severely disappointed when they realized the school was not providing free uh, you know substances. <laughs> uh, but we were even in the yearbook that way, which was crazy. But yeah. eventually, we got to change to Bible Club, and so. That was my that was my high school experience. Uh, so during that time, were there uh, people outside the school, whether it's parents, youth workers, local church pastors, church members, praying for you all as you as you did this? Were you aware of that? Well, there were there were people from church for sure. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, I was not aware. You know, in high school, I was not aware of moms in prayer and and didn't know about that. And I w I wish that I had. Um, but there, yeah, there, you know, certainly people were praying and, and we felt their prayers. We felt the power of those prayers for sure. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we were part of one of the first national see you at the poll gatherings, 1991. And, uh, and so to know that you're praying with, you know, thousands and thousands of people across the country on the same day at the same time, that's pretty, that was pretty amazing. 
Uh, so prayer was a powerful part of that experience for certain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's 100%. good. That's good. So so the school district I was in, the Abington School District in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, that's where I, I grew up. And I was there through eighth grade. We, we moved. My dad was a pastor, and uh, we went to an adjoining district, Upper Dublin, which uh, was really on the heels of what I experienced in Abington. Um, it was kind of the, the same thing. Um, so I'm in first grade, and uh, I remember Miss Wallace, our teacher, who I loved, who was a believer— and was willing to speak, you know, publicly about being a believer, uh, would, as in all the other classrooms in the Abington School District at that time, begin our day uh, with uh, a Bible reading and a prayer. And I remember, uh, you know, students even struggling in first grade uh, to have the opportunity to hold the Bible and read the Bible. When I came back in second grade, that was done. We were not doing that. In fact, there was a deep, deep um, sensitivity to not even go near that or mention it. And the reason for that was in our school district in 1962-1963, um, that was ground zero for the Supreme Court case that took Bible reading out of the mm. and prayer out of the schools, and that was um, Shemp versus the Board of Education. Um, Ellery Shemp, let's see if I get his name right, I know exactly where he lived, was a high school student at the time. And he challenged uh, the fact that this was happening. And so I've read the history of that just to get a sense of what was going on. My dad, who was a pastor, was very involved in some of the pushback on that and the desire to maintain Bible reading and prayer in school. And regardless of where our listeners fall on an understanding of this, it was a, it was a deeply um, difficult watershed moment that I even remember as a first grader being tough. And so as we... You know, as we talk about this, by the way, my graduating class, if I had stayed in that district, Travis, this was, it was 1,200 people. And uh-huh. so okay. it would have been, I would have been lost. We just had our 50th reunion, and so I, I did not go, but I tracked with those friends as they gathered. And so it was, it was 1,200. But uh, so that was, so, so when I got to high school to the Upper Dublin District, we were at a point where this was such a sensitive thing that we didn't even call Christmas programs. We weren't allowed to call Christmas programs Christmas programs. They were holiday programs. And even mm. even to the point where in certain schools you weren't allowed to, like, put cut out snowflakes in windows or anything associated with uh, the Christmas holiday or even the holidays at all. So uh, mm. my my experience was one where this was just washed away and you were not allowed to do this. And this is why I'm excited about our, our conversation today because, Travis, what you've experienced and what you're doing with the nine-month mission trip – and, you know, getting students seeing their school as a, as a mission field, you understand the legal ramifications, the borders and the boundaries, but also outside of school to have parents praying. And I know this has been a long introduction to get our guests on, but I want to go to uh, my friend Sue Forey right now because Sue, uh, she's local here in Lancaster County. Sue, would you introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about your involvement with Moms in Prayer? And then I'm going to have you introduce uh, Diane, who's our state coordinator here in Pennsylvania for Moms in Prayer International. Yes, thank you, Walt. So my name is Sue Forey. I was born and raised in Lancaster County. I've been married to my husband, Dan, for 27 years. We have five children. They all were schooled in the public school. Um, some went to secular colleges, one, and then the other three are the, yeah, the other three are Grove City College um, or graduated from there. So I had to get that in there for you, Walt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am a regional coordinator for Moms in Prayer International, which means I oversee the counties of Lancaster, Lebanon, and Berks. And I could tell you story after story after story of how God is moving through the ministry of praying for children in schools through Moms in Prayer. Um, I lead a group, a college and career group. That's an in-person group. So we have women that have children either in college or they've graduated from college or they didn't go to college. And so we pray for them every other week. Um, I also lead a group for Grove City College and that group meets by Zoom. Um, We pray every week. And I, again, could share story after story after story of how God has moved through a group of praying moms for our college students. And then I also attend a group for Hemfield High School, which is where I have a, a daughter who attends there. And so we are praying each week for the Hemfield High School and the middle schools. 
And I work under our state coordinator for the state of Pennsylvania for Moms in Prayer International, Diane Impolito. She is a wonderful mentor and friend and has a passion as well for praying for children in schools. Yeah, so Diane, welcome, and thanks, Sue, for that. Uh, Diane, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I want to hear more about the mission and the vision of Moms in Prayer International. Absolutely. So I live in central Pennsylvania. I live in Lewisburg, um, and we've been here 20 years, so I guess I'm almost a Pennsylvanian now. My husband was in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot when our children were little. We have three adult children um, who are all grown and gone. <laughs> but um, we are grateful to be here in central Pennsylvania. And I have been with Moms in Prayer. I started praying in 1993. So I've been praying a long time with Moms in Prayer um, for my kids. And, and I still pray. I also um, lead a group. I lead a group for prodigals. Um, and then I also pray in a group um, for just for the school, some of the local schools. And it is, it's just such a great thing. So Moms in Prayer started out, this is Moms in Prayer's 40th anniversary. They started in 1984 and they have grown from one woman gathering women around her table to pray to being in more than 150 countries around the world. And our mission is to impact the world for Christ by gathering women to pray for children and schools. And that is, we just feel like that's such an important thing that we need to be lifting children in prayer. We They've always needed prayer. It's nothing new, but they need prayer in different, you know, in different ways now. Mm. And, and in the intro, thank you for that. In the intro uh, for, to this particular podcast, I mentioned that woman, uh, Fern Nichols, who in 1984 mm. started to pray. And it, it, as I read about that in the history of Moms in Prayer, it seems that, as it's described, she was heavy in her heart for her two oldest sons who were going into junior high school and now starting yeah. to face the unique temptations related to life in junior high, of course, life in high school, as Sue said, life in college. It's really li lifelong now for all of us. Um, but, you know, ad adolescents at that point in life where they, they become, kids start to become far more vulnerable because they're moving from concrete thinking to abstract thinking. There's more, there's more freedom. Uh, there are more pressures, more opportunities. And so she was, she was really moved by that. So I, I want to center in on that. We're going to take a break, but I want to center in on that because folks who listen to Youth Culture Matters are especially concerned about a lot of the issues that our kids are facing today. And so I want to tap into that and look at ways that we can be praying. Uh, you too can guide us because of your experience in this and help us understand what the prayers of the heart have been for so many moms. And, and I want to tap into Travis as well and ask a little bit about what he's seeing uh, to guide us in our prayers for our students as well. But we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Stick with us. Judson College believes that there is no greater task to call students to than devoting their lives to Christ and his mission in the world. That's why they equip students to give their lives for the cause of Christ in the church, among the nations, and in every aspect of society, and why they offer a world-class confessional Christian education at an affordable rate in a vibrant community. At Judson College, your student doesn't have to choose between their Christian convictions and a quality education. With biblical and professional training for a variety of careers and ministries, Judson College can be a trusted next step in your student's education. Visit judsoncollege.com to learn more or to plan a visit. Welcome back to Youth Culture Matters. I'm Walt Bueller. We're having a conversation now with Travis Deans, and we're joined as well by Sue Forey and Diane Ippolito from Moms in Prayer International. And we're, we're really concerned here at CPYU, uh, those of you who, tra who have tracked with us for over 35 years now, about helping those who minister and lead and minister to, lead and love kids understand this rapidly changing mission field of today's youth culture. And so uh, those of you who've tracked with us, you know that we work very hard 
to help you understand what's happening in the world and how to bring the light of God's Word to bear on that. And prayer is such a big part of that. Uh, I want to go to Travis. And Travis, how long have you been involved in youth ministry? Just refresh me on that. Uh, So since 1996, full time. Okay, so you're a newbie. Um, compared to, <laughs> compared to a couple of us, right? Um, I still, th- I look at you guys like, like kids, you're almost up to 30 years, which is, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But, but Travis, what in your work with high schools and, and with students and with youth workers, what are you hearing are some of the biggest issues now that they're facing as a result of growing up in today's youth culture? And these would be prayer points, certainly for everyone who's listening, um, you know, how, yeah. what, what are we, what are you seeing and, and how can we be praying for our kids? Well, uh, so several things. One, one would be, um, you know, the, the advent of technology that we have today has been a huge factor. You know, back in, when I was in high school, you know, we were using Commodore 64s and Apple twos and, yeah. you know, <laughs> right now, now kids, this, the sophistication that kids have today with using technology has just, uh, you know, it's quantum, it's a quantum leap, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's a big thing, but yeah, let me, let me, let me say something to that because I used an abacus. So just so you know, (laughs) if you know what an abacus is, it actually sounds like a growth you'd have a dermatologist remove, but we used an abacus, (laughs) but I, I, you know, joking, (laughs) but you know, you're right on with that. I mean, that has just changed everything and it's ramped everything else up because every other pressure you'll mention now is really going viral through social media. So I know this weekend I'm traveling to Montana to speak about digital discipleship to parents out there. And it's it's a huge issue that if we ignore it, we're not helping our kids navigate it well. And so I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That has changed everything. Go ahead, yeah, what else? Like, like I say, it's intensified everything. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that along with that is the um, just environment, awareness and engagement of social issues. Uh, like when I was in high school, Kids were worried about where the next uh, drinking party was going to be, right? That's that's what they were thinking about. Today, kids are thinking about they're thinking about uh, you know people who are oppressed, people who are victims, people who are you know, they're thinking about things that are much much bigger, much more uh, consequential uh, issues that are more consequential than than we did in high school. And and I believe that provides a great opportunity for for the church. Uh, because uh, if we equip our students, if we equip students in our ministries well, they can have some great conversations with people that that you know might have been more difficult to have you know 30, 40 years ago, or at least uh, <laughs> seems strange 30, 40 years ago. So I think that along with the complications, you know, I, I you pastor tell me he he said I, you know I'm glad that I'm. Uh, I've ha- had 15 years of youth ministry experience because if I had to deal with now what I, you know, if I was a new youth pastor having to deal with stuff now that I'm dealing with, I, I would not know what to do. Um, you know, but along with the complications are opportunities because there is, um, you know, there, there's such a deep uh, spiritual truth has been missing so long uh, biblical literacy has been missing for so long now that there are kids who they're looking, they're looking for something, anything that gives life meaning and purpose. And, 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 uh, that's what, you know, now we're seeing camps, summer camps that are packed with kids. We're seeing campus ministries that are packed with students. Uh, and I, and I think it's in part because we've, we've deprived kids of spiritual truth for so long. They're just starving for something. Yeah, that's so good. And I, you know, as I'm thinking about this, what great opportunities for prayer. I I just want to comment on that, on what you said last there, that I think in the youth ministry world, and look, I've been part of this because I've been in this this world for 50 years now, um, that early on, a lot of what we did and the legacy we left for some of you younger guys, Travis, was one of, you know, let's, let's, let's entertain our kids and let's sneak in some truth. Right. So that was a lot of the way we did that. Right. And, um, now we're seeing, and you are spot on God created us, uh, for a relationship with himself. That relationship has been broken. We desire, whether we are cognizant of that or not, we desire truth. It's that God saved, God saved, uh, shaped vacuum 
that Blaise Pascal talked about so often. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I think getting back to the word and teaching, you know, Kyle Hoffsmith here does our Word and Youth Ministry podcast. We're, We're encouraging people to teach the Bible, know the Bible, teach the Bible. But then there's the element of prayer. And that's where I want to turn to Sue and Diane and really hear from you now for the the rest of the podcast. Uh, Help us with this and not just help us with this, you know, giving us a sense of how to best pray. And you can model that for us, I'm sure, through your experiences. But then before we end today, I do want to I do want to connect people with Moms in Prayer and uh, get them to grab your vision for things. So I don't care who speaks first, but go ahead and just uh, let us know a little bit about how you're managing these things as you pray for your children. Well, I'll jump I in. Wanna, I would. I'll, I'll jump in, Diane, and then I'll let you go. Just to, to piggyback on what Travis said, I realized the other day that um, I had I had prayed with two other moms, and we have, I would say, well-adjusted Christian teenagers. And what, what we were praying for was anxiety. And I think we're really seeing that today with our with our teens. We're really seeing anxiety. And I love that moms in prayer prays. We have prayer sheets, which Diane will go more into. But on our website, all of our prayer sheets at the bottom have pray for revival and spiritual awakening. And every time I pray that every week at my moms in prayer group, that hits it. If I'm mm-hmm. praying for revival and spiritual awakening in the schools, in my children's lives, that hits it. And Moms in Prayer has taught me how to pray. I grew up in a church. I grew up, I mean, Youth for Christ was where I had my teaching um, in in high school. That's where I, but I was never really taught how to pray. And Moms in Prayer took that and taught me how to pray. So that's why I am so passionate about sharing Moms in Prayer with other moms. But even if a youth leader can teach a teen how to pray, use the method, use the four steps of prayer that Moms in Prayer has out there available for you at the website, momsinprayer.org. Use that and teach your students how to pray. I wish I would have been taught how to pray when I was younger. So I'll let Diane expand a little bit more on Moms in Prayer. Yeah. And I want to hear about the four steps too that you've mentioned. That's what I was going to say is we recognize that it's really hard to, to sit down and pray. And we get distracted easily. And Fern knew that from the very beginning. So she came up with, she said, we need to guard our time. We're all busy women. So we're going to pray for an hour and we're going to do it in a step-by-step method, because if we don't, the squirrels are just going to go running across and we're going to go chasing them. And, you know, it's not going to happen. So we start with praise and we praise God for who he is. Then we have a time of silent confession, a minute or two, and then we go into sharing thanksgivings. And that is one of my favorite parts because we're thanking God for what he has done in answer to our prayers. So that builds our faith as we're hearing other moms give thanks that, you know, I prayed for for this to happen and I'm seeing a change. I'm seeing this difference. I'm seeing this. So we just, you know, we rejoice in that. And then we pray scripturally for our children, and we always pray first for their spiritual walk, because we know that if they are not walking with the Lord, it doesn't matter if they get an A on the test, it doesn't matter if they get into the best college, they need to be walking with the Lord. So we pray for each of our children that they would have this spiritual walk first, and then we can pray for the the various things that we want to pray for, which are important, but they're not nearly as important as that spiritual walk. Mm-hmm. Then we do go on and pray for the schools, and we pray, we encourage women to pray, get the list. You can go online and get the whole faculty list for schools now, mm-hmm. and we pray for, for the, whatever school we're choosing to cover, I will have prayed for every teacher and everybody on the faculty list in that school by name with their name in scripture. And if we don't know their walk, we pray from Acts, we pray, open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a faith and a place among those who are being sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. And I will pray that over every teacher. And so will all these other women, hundreds of women who are praying across Pennsylvania. So the schools that are covered, we try to cover them really well in prayer. And it's it's good for the schools. It's wonderful. We hear things all the time. The Thanksgivings are good. But it's also good for us because it builds our faith and it makes us stronger, more confident parents, grandparents, mentors, whatever we are. 
I'm curious, the response from uh, teachers and the administrators, talk a little bit about that. Um, well, because of the laws that you talked about, we don't pray in public schools. Right. And we do not go and tell them we're praying for them. Okay. If it's a Christian school, that's a different thing. But for the public schools, we don't tell them we're praying for them. That's not something we do. Um, we we know that prayer is effective. We don't need to let them know that we're praying for them. Yeah. Have you, um, I think it's your group. I mean, have you folks been involved in uh, serving the folks at that school, the administration and the faculty different times with, like I hear stories of snacks and, you know, on holidays or in-service days, whatever. That yeah, so you can take that one. Yeah, we, we call it words and deeds. Um, it's completely optional for a moms in prayer group to do. We do ask that they um, meet with the principal beforehand or ask for permission. Um, we are not in, we are not there to create any controversy. We are there for one reason, and that is to pray. So if you, if a mom goes to a, a principal and says, hey, can I, can I bring in a snack? And the principal says no, then we say, okay, thank you. And, and that's it. Um, we're not, like I said, we're not there to be, we're, I mean, we live in this time of school boards and, and everything else, and we're not there to create controversy. However, if a principal does grant us favor, then we will simply take in a snack. It can be anything from little chocolates to lifesavers. Um, one year when I was teaching, we had uh, apples with caramel and dips and all kinds of things, and it was fabulous. And we, we don't even single out our names. On the card, we just put, enjoy this from Moms in Prayer. Um, we're not seeking, uh, you know, oh, I hope this teacher knows that I'm a believer and they'll give my child favor, or it could work the opposite way, um, that a teacher may think, you know, oh, this child's a believer and that's, that's something I stand against. So we, we are not there in the schools to create controversy, um, but we're there to bless the schools and to serve them. So yes, we, we do words and deeds and we love, um, praying for our teachers and just showing them that we're, we're, we're there to support them is what we're there for. Mm. What about the, and we, in that uh, oh, way ahead, we Diane. pray for the, in that way, we also do the same thing with ministries, but again, with youth ministries, it's a little different. So if we know that there is a child evangelism fellowship or um, some other uh, fellowship of Christian athletes, something like that going into a school, a group leader has the, has the option. She doesn't have to, but she can contact that, that leader of that group and say, we're praying for this school. How can we pray for you? Mm. How can we pray for your ministry? Do you have something coming up that needs prayer? And we are happy. We love praying for the ministries. I mean, we pray for them anyway. We pray that they'll be successful, but it's it's great to have some specific things to pray for. We love that connection. Yeah. So, so I'm sitting here going, okay, if you haven't done it already, put CPYU on your list. Uh, yeah, we definitely need that. I, and I know Travis would appreciate that well with what he's doing. Would you, one of you mentioned something about uh, prayer groups for prodigals. Talk a little that bit about me. that. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, Diane. Well, we, we recognize that women are in different places. And so we have all different sorts of prayer groups. We have prayer groups for grandmothers. We have prayer groups for people who aren't mothers. We have people, you know, we have all just women gathering women to pray. But Women who have prodigals, we have a special burden mm -hmm. um, that that there is just uh, an intensity that you need to pray with. And there are things that you need to pray that the scriptures that we would pray for our children who are walking with the Lord are not the same ones we would pray for those who are not. Yeah. So um, I lead a group for prodigals and we we actually put we put two verses on our sheet one for those walking with the lord and one for those not walking with the lord so if women are only part of this group they don't neglect all their other children just to concentrate on their prodigal all the time but we pray um again for for them to return that is that is the most important thing we know that they need to come to know the lord as their savior Tell, oh did you want to say something travis no, go ahead. Well, yep. yeah, I was I was going to say, can you tell us a little bit about those prayer sheets? They're available yes. on the site. I'm I'm wondering, you know, what will we find when we find those, and and how can yes. we use those? And and I would encourage youth pastors, churches, anyone who's listening, go on the website, look at the website, look at the prayer sheets. They will walk you through an attribute of God. 
Um, it, maybe you want to you want to pick the attribute God equips, and so you're going to pull up. You can you can either use the mobile version of that prayer sheet, or you can download a Word document. Um, whatever suits you. I have young moms that are obviously using that mobile prayer sheet. I'm right around Travis's age there, so I'm printing my prayer sheets. Um, so we would look at scripture that looks at how God equips, and we would read the scripture in our group. Again, youth pastors, they can do this with their youth group. It's a little mini Bible study of how does God equip? So we're looking at, um, then it has the time, it has a verse for confession, and then it has a verse for Thanksgiving, and then it has the scripture, as Diane said, to pray for our children. So we're putting, I mean, they can put their their friends' names in that scripture. Um, it, it's it's all right there. And then there are prayer requests for, for the schools. So that's always on the prayer sheet. We have a prayer calendar that has a lot of prayer requests. Um, some are specific to moms and prayer, but some are specific to youth culture. And I also want to add that we also have groups for homeschool moms, preschool moms, public school moms, mm. private school moms. And, and I know I talked with a mom yesterday and she's wrestling with, is public school the right place for my child? And we could talk all day about, you know, where, where kids are placed in school and what type of schooling. What I want women to know is we are here, no matter what decision you make public school, private school, homeschool. I, I say to myself, who needs more prayer? The public school, the private school, the homes, they all need prayer. So that's what we're here for. But go on the website, look at those resources. Your church can use those prayer sheets for a prayer time. Those re There's Bible studies on there, um, podcasts that they can listen to, resources for women who want to start a group, all types of information for anyone looking to, to um, increase and learn more about praying. Awesome. All right, we're going to take another break also, here. Oh, go ahead, Diane. I'll, I'll let you speak before I was we break. Say, okay, when you were talking about the gathering and the, the gathering together and all praying at one time, um, we have a global celebration of prayer. And we used to try to do it in one day. And now that we're spread across so many countries all around the world, we actually do it for a week. And there will be a week in January when every group around the world will pray the same prayer sheet. We will pray the same things over all of our kids all around the world. And that is just such a neat heart connection to have because we moms okay. have that connection. I've prayed with women from all over the world at some of the Moms in Prayer International gatherings, and we all have the same heart for our kids. Mm. I'm just going to say as a dad, as a grandfather, as uh, someone who's been in youth ministry on a church staff now, you know, with a nonprofit faith-based ministry, uh, this is awesome. Um, just yeah. hearing about this and seeing some of the inner workings of this, it's awesome. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, get a little more practical about uh, some of the other resources that are there, uh, how you can get involved in Moms in Prayer, and then I'm going to ask these folks about anything specific. I'm going to tip my hand here and let you know I'm going to come back and ask you uh, about some of the prayer helps that have been very, very uh, important to you in your life. Uh, whether that's a book, a website, or whatever. And so we're, we're big on sharing resources here. I brought some of mine in, and I'm curious to hear about what you have. So let's take a break. We'll be right back. We're excited to announce and invite all of our youth worker friends to join us for the third annual Northeast Youth Ministry Summit to be held March 17 to 20 of 2025 in Ligonier, Pennsylvania. This is a lively gathering of rookie youth workers, seasoned youth ministry veterans, paid and volunteer who come together to be equipped for ministry while connecting in rich community in the beautiful Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania. While held in the Northeast, the summit is open to everyone. Last year, youth workers ranging in age from 19 to 77 came from 21 different states and three countries. This year's theme is Changing World, Unchanging Word. You will receive top-notch training from seasoned youth ministry trainers and experts on how to teach the Bible, how to understand and respond biblically to cultural influences, and how to practically and effectively minister in a world full of emerging challenges and choices. To learn more, see the speakers, browse the full schedule, and to register, visit nymsummit.org. That's nymsummit.org. I hope to see you at the Northeast Youth Ministry Summit in March.
Well, I want to say thanks again to Judson College for stepping up to sponsor this episode of Youth Culture Matters and remind you all that if you want to learn more, you visit judsoncollege.com, judsoncollege.com. Thanks to them for their sponsorship of Youth Culture Matters. Well, I'm going to circle back here in our last segment. And, uh, Travis, I want to go to you because you have a story I think you can share about a Moms in Prayer group and a high school. You want to share that story? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, what I love about Moms in Prayer is, you know, Walt, you, you mentioned the uh, the barriers between, you know, public school and, and faith and and the church for so long has has believed that schools are just off limits. You yeah. know, there's nothing we can do there, right? And uh, and that's the genius of Moms of Prayer is that prayer reaches beyond any human barriers. You know, no, no matter what human barrier is set up, God can work behind that barrier. And so, um, I and I recommend you know I recommend to youth pastors and campus ministry leaders all the time reach out to the Moms and Prayer group near you or or help the moms uh, in your church start a group um because that prayer support is everything for people in ministry so um there was a group of moms who were praying for a particular school uh kiski high school uh in uh pennsylvania here and they'd been praying for a number of years and there was a group of uh young men who were part of it they were part of a youth ministry uh, and uh, their youth pastor encouraged them to uh, do see you at the poll at their school and they had a ton of kids that showed up at the at the poll to pray, and it was so great. Uh, they loved it so much. They kept praying, and that entire school year, ninety to hundred kids met every morning at that school to pray for their school. Now, can I scientifically prove there was a connection there? No, but I one hundred percent believe that because there were moms praying for that school diligently you know, uh, purposefully, uh, passionately praying, God did something in those students that school year. And, and that school year was not only did they pray, but they did a lot of things to share the gospel in school, in their school that year. Uh, and I, I 100% believe it was because there was a group of moms that had been praying that God would do a great work that like what you mentioned Sue, the, the spiritual awakening and revival uh, God did that in that school that year, and I, I know, I know it was because there was a group of moms faithfully praying for that school. Mm. That's great. That's great. We hey. do hear, we do hear stories like that all the time. I'm as the state coordinator, I put together what's called the State of the State Report, and I ask the women for um, for for stories like that. And I hear stories about you know we prayed for an FCA gathering. They were just starting an FCA club, and they hoped they'd have ten people, and they had 120, you know, and things like that because we prayed, and, and we know you know we 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 know that power of prayer. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Travis, I know you're going to have to knock off here for a meeting before we actually finish up. So thank you. I, I want to ask you, if you would, would you just let people know how to get uh, more information on National Network and then also your nine-month mission trip? Yeah. So uh, if you go to youthworkers.net, uh, youth leaders can get connected with other youth pastors, youth leaders in their community, uh, youthworkers.net. Uh, nine-month mission trip is uh, – you can connect with resources we have at nine month mission trip dot com. Um, and if you're in if you're in Pennsylvania, we have a, a campus clubs website too called outreachclubs.com. dot uh, com. If you're not in Pennsylvania, we'd be happy to connect you with another uh, campus ministry organization that's out there. Uh, but yep, those are youthworkers.net, dot nine month mission trip dot com and outreachclubs dot com. Yeah, that's great. And and you know, moms, as you're listening to this, and dads as well, everybody. Uh, let's pray for Travis and use those websites as places to to get prayer prompts so we know uh, who to be praying for, what to be praying for. Travis, thank you so much. I'm, I know I'm going to see you soon. Uh, I'll see you at the Northeast Youth Ministry Summit, I'm sure, uh, oh, yeah. in March. So I'm excited about that. So thanks, Travis. Now let me go uh, back to the ladies here. And any any particular stories you want to share, either of you, about uh, some of the things you've seen happen as a result of the prayer? Well, I have, <laughs> it's an interesting thing that I have because my son is a missionary in Pennsylvania doing after school clubs. He does foam sword fighting ministry. It's called Stronghold. Um, Stronghold foam sword fighting. I have to stop and, and collect my thoughts here for a minute because <laughs> I, I've never heard this before and I'm trying to imagine it and I'm going, that's a club I would have liked to have been in. 
That just exactly. foam sword fighting. Yes. Okay. And All right. I, I got it. <laughs> so he partners with um, churches to do after school clubs in, you know, churches that are near schools so they can get the kids to come right there and so on. And we get, I get to pray for that. Of course, I know what's happening where um, and, and what's, you know, what's going on. I often provide food. Um, but besides that, I, praying for that and then seeing the Lord bring kids when they start out in a new school and people don't know what this is, you know, we're going to go hit each other with swords. I don't know whether that's cool or not, you know, and they get this group of kids. And at one of the schools where he was starting at a church near a public school, um, they only had a group of three kids show up. And he said, well, I'm sorry, that's not enough. I love that you want to do this, but we have to have more kids. And one of the kids said, well, I think this is so cool. I want to, I, I will go find kids. And the next week there were 10 kids there. Mm. So we prayed, you know, that he would get kids and they were all, those 10 kids were all unchurched. They didn't even know who Jesus was. And part of the curriculum is you do Bible study. And so, you know, he had to pivot his Bible study a little to go back to who is Jesus, who is God. But it was, it was a great testimony there that because of prayer, this, you know, this God not only brought some kids, then he brought a kid who was on fire and ready to go gather more kids. Yeah, that that is, yeah, and just what a creative way, right? To uh, I'm actually I'm thinking of going on Amazon and ordering some foam swords right now for our office here. Um, we might use it to settle <laughs> conflicts rather than build relationships, but I love that idea. That's a great, great thing. So yeah, that is so neat, Sue. Anything? you want to share? Yes, I actually thought of two um, things that I would like to share. One is as we pray for Grove City College, because of the policies and, and guidelines that Moms in Prayer has, we have guardrails um, and you can find them in our booklet. Our booklet is a great resource. You can find that online, either in a paper version or a, an online version. Um, but we do not ask public school teachers, as we talked about for prayer requests. However, for private schools, we can. So each week for Grove City College, when we have our prayer time, I will email three of the professors or staff and, and just introduce myself, kind of an establish a safe connection and, and just let them know that we're praying for them. I'll share the scripture that we're going to pray for them. And then I'll ask for any prayer requests. And last year I had emailed a professor and I'm, I'm very methodical. So I'm going through this list in alphabetical order. By the way, and you're not to... shy either. So I just, in <laughs> case you haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. Um, so I hear back from this professor and, and this professor said, this is the first time I've ever had a parent ask me how they could pray for me. And that really just moved me to, okay, we need to step up our prayer game. We need to be praying more for not only our private schools, but our public schools, like I said, our home schools as well. And then the other thing that, that I want to share, and I think you'll appreciate this, Walt, I was listening to Jim Burns. And he was talking about the helicopter parents and, yep. and launching our children. And he said, the helicopter has landed. And Moms in Prayer has taught me how to land the helicopter. I have learned from mentor moms in my Moms in Prayer group how to launch my children well and how to land the helicopter and let them be on their own. You know, it started in kindergarten with that little bit of a releasing, and then it went on to middle school, and then high school, watch out, and college, like you need to let go. And I have talked with mom after mom after mom who, when their kids go off to college, they're like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't let my child go. This is when I'm going to my moms and prayer group and I'm saying, I can't, I can't let my child go. Would you help me? And that's when I'm grabbing another mom we're praying specifically for my child. We're praying that scripture, as Diane mentioned, and then we're letting that child go. And the helicopter has landed. I appreciate you bringing that up because, you know, when we talk here about trends in youth culture, we talk a lot about what's going on with parents. And that is an issue right now that it's really significant and different from the generation of my parents who, you know, there, there was no helicopter um, there was almost, and I say this, you know, facetiously, it was almost like a kick out the door when you go to college and they were happy to see you grow up. They were happy for that. And we've really lost our ability to create the kind of resiliency in kids that leads them into healthy adulthood. 
uh, you know, physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. And so I appreciate you saying that. And so, um, yeah, I, I, this is just, you're helping me see, you're helping us who are listening here see how multi-layered this ministry is and just how helpful it is. And and I, why am I surprised? I shouldn't be surprised because prayer is foundational to everything. And and I think about, you know, two things in the lives of our kids that, that right at the top of the list need to happen is as we raise them, you know, one obviously is praying for them. The other is just pouring God's word into their lives, uh, both as we teach it verbally and as we and as we live it out. And so this is a component that I think, you know, like, Sue, so at the beginning, you, you said, like, Moms and Prayers really taught you how to pray. We need this. Mm-hmm. And this is where I want to encourage everybody to connect, check out the website and get there. And so um, let me go to Diane, your state coordinator. What can parents do right now? Uh, moms who want to jump in on this, and and I guess can dads? Am I allowed to creep around on the website and make use of what's there? Absolutely. Okay. All right. You're not. My gonna... husband uses our prayer yeah, sheets to lead some, to lead the men's prayer group. Yeah. Leads. Okay. There you go. So t- tell us how to. We're, we don't hold. We don't hold on to prayer. We say yeah. you can pray. Yes. yes okay. Please. You can't be part of a moms and prayer group, though. Right. We do have policies. Yes. <laughs> and we do say moms and prayer groups are just for women. Yeah. But I want to say, I want to say something first that um Fern Nichols says Satan trembles to see the least saint on her knees. And I think moms who are feeling anxious in any way, we are for you. We gather together and you bring your anxiety in. I have a friend who says she'll watch me come into my mom's in prayer group. And as, as soon as we start to pray, as soon as we start thinking about the attributes of God, she just watches my shoulders relax. That I'm just like, I'm in, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm in God's place now. I'm looking to him instead of my fears, my anxieties. Um, so women can go on the website. And the website is amazing. It does, as Sue said, it has all kinds of resources. It has all kinds of, uh, there's a training channel podcast that tells you all about in 15 minutes or less, little things you want to know about moms in prayer from how to start a group to what are the four steps um, and all the little questions. But there's also a place where it says, um, are you new to moms in prayer? And it says, find a group, join a group, and you just fill out some information and it comes to me. (laughs) <laughs> and it comes to someone else who's across Pennsylvania. We have women all across Pennsylvania. Um, Sue said she's in Le- Lancaster, Lebanon, and Berks. We have 10 regions across Pennsylvania. We are covered all over the place with women who will connect you to someone who is praying in a group already. Or the mom. we keep moms on record who are waiting for someone else to pray for. Okay. Maybe you're that one. Uh, and, and you're talking just about Pennsylvania, but any state. You can access from any state oh, in the country. So we have listeners all over. And there's a global there's a global Great. page as well. You can say I'm from I wouldn't get that one, but yes, yeah. you could say yeah. that. Yeah, I, I see the list here of the booklet, how many languages it's been translated into. Sixty seven languages, which is um, you know, amazing. And 29 different country coordinators, so, which is which is great as well. So three international directors. So check out uh, the site. Now, let me ask, um, with, oh, and by the way, the site is momsinprayer.org. And I want to mention that anything that's been mentioned on this podcast, uh, whether it be books, websites, resources, whatever, Chris Wagner here at CPYU, uh, those of you who know how this works, uh, you go to cpyu.org, look for the player for this particular episode of the podcast. You'll find it right on the homepage. You'll be able to click through Youth Culture Matters. And down underneath the player will be links to everything that's been mentioned, including Moms in Prayer. And then also what I want to ask about right now as we finish up. Um, I have some favorite helps for prayer. And, and I am a person who very much appreciates printed prayers that have depth and it have history that help me to pray and then also you know not only in the moment but direct how to pray that have shaped how I pray and I'm going to list some of those here but I wondered for the two of you is there anything in particular you would mention that's been a helpful resource to you that folks could get a hold of and most likely something not involved uh, you know on the moms and prayer site but rather something that for you personally over the years has been really helpful. 
Well, mine does come from the Moms in Prayer website. And that's okay. <laughs> because uh, Sally Burke and Cindy Claypool Deneve wrote a book called Starts with Praise. And um, it is a 40-day devotional on praying the four steps of prayer. And it is good for anybody to use, but it just goes through, again, just teaching you how to pray. And there's a little bit about, you know, verses, scriptures shared and then verses, and it goes on there. And there's also, um, Moms in Prayer has a prayer journal and it um, is available, it was called God is Faithful. And they, um, in the prayer journal, again, there's these attributes we talked about, and then there's a place to write out these prayers. There's a, there's a little bit of a, a devotional, I guess, about it. And then there's a place to write out the prayers. And they just came out with a brand new one because our 40th anniversary celebration, uh, we are saying we're victorious in Christ. And so um, there is a new journal out called Victorious. And for any of those things, when you go on the Moms in Prayer website, there is a shop tab because we women love to shop. And the link will take you through to Christian Book. Anything you buy through that link on Christian Book, you can buy anything. You can do all your Christmas shopping there, buy cards, games. It doesn't have to be Moms in Prayer materials. Moms in Prayer gets a portion of that. Mm. So we encourage women to shop through. Um, it's an easy way to to support Moms in Prayer. Yeah, and I would say just with what you mentioned there, uh, there are other books that Sally Burke has written, Fern Nichols books, additional resources. And that's all, when you go on the Moms in Prayer website, you can find a fact sheet. Those are all listed on the fact sheet. So, Sue, anything that you've used that's been helpful for you, um, you know, in your own prayer life? Yes. Well, and I would agree with Diane. I mean, the Moms in Prayer website, that that has taught me, there's so many resources on there, and that has really taught me um, how to pray, and, and, and I just appreciate that. But I also want to share, and, and these are all Moms in Prayer related. I mean, we are an army of praying moms, and so we link arms together. We share resources. We encourage one another. Brave Moms, Brave Kids by Lee Neenheis has been a great resource for me. In fact, I, I was teaching something, getting ready to teach something, and I pulled out that book, and, and that just has been such a great resource. Um, Praying the Scriptures by Joni Burnt mm -hmm. um, has also been a great resource. She's a Moms and Prayer mom. She has Praying the Scriptures for your adult children, Praying the Scriptures for your husband, um, lots of resources. And then this one is an old one, um, What Happens When Women Pray by Evelyn Christensen. Mm -hmm. And that oh. actually, yeah, that spurned Fern on to start Moms in Prayer. Um, that was a great resource that she used. And and um, when I read that this past summer, I, I was underlining and highlighting, and I was like, this is, this is just an amazing book. I mean, there's other books from that time period as well about prayer um, that I want to read, but, but there's just, yeah, so many great resources out there. And, and those are some that I would recommend. Okay. That's great. Now I'm going to, I'm going to chime in with some of mine, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I kind of giggled a little bit when you said that, you know, mo we moms, we love to shop. Now I realize why you don't let men in there. Um, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to share something like I, I have books I use in the morning. I have sort of a morning ritual with, with Bible reading and prayer. It's interesting this morning, um, and, and by the way, I, I want to go back some, Diane, you said when you start to pray, you, you pray through the attributes of God, and that is doctrine. And so we've really pushed here at CPYU, when I teach students, like a couple weeks ago, I was up in Canada for a week teaching grad and undergrad students, and I tell them, it, doctrine is important for your youth ministry, that you need to know who God is and how to teach that and help your students understand that. And that, that really sparks our prayer, our praise, right? And, and ways to pray into that. So uh, just this morning, I, I used the um, several catechisms, but the New City Catechism, which Tim Keller was involved with. I'm a couple weeks behind here, but I went to question 38 when I opened it this morning. I said, oh, how appropriate for today. The question is, what is prayer? And mm -hmm. the answer in the catechism, quite simply, is prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. And then there's some commentary there. But uh, I'm just going to mention some of the prayer books that have been very helpful for me. One of my favorites, um, I believe that those who have come before us in church history can really teach us how to pray. And so uh, the Valley of Vision prayer book, which is a, a collection of Puritan prayers, the richness in this, and, and it, even as I think, Diane, about praying the attributes of God, 
Um, so amazing. I, I cannot get enough of this. It's like a bottomless treasure chest. It's like, you know, when you read scripture, you never, you never come to the end. And then we have a friend here, Scotty Smith, who uh, Scotty has written a couple of great prayer books, Everyday Prayers, uh, 365 Days to a Gospel-Centered Faith, and then also Every Season Prayers, Gospel-Centered Prayers for the Whole of Life, which are more about circumstances and, and you know, certain times on the calendar, things like that. Tim Keller's book on prayer, Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God, very helpful. And then I'm going to sound super old school here, um, but I, I have... Um, uh, evangelical Anglican Roots and uh, the ACNA um, Anglican Church in North America. Their Book of Common Prayer is just a wonderful collection of prayers and, and guidance for how to pray. So um, hopefully moms can can uh, take some of those recommendations and supplement their prayer life as well as uh, we here will will tap into what you folks are doing. So again, it's uh, Moms in Prayer International momsinprayer.org we've heard today about the importance of prayer and we have not even begun to scratch the surface of what God is doing in the lives of students through these moms these women who are praying so Diane thank you for what you do and for directing things here in Pennsylvania and helping us understand more thanks for that it's a privilege it's a privilege and a joy to get to serve and the women in Pennsylvania are amazing I, I absolutely love traveling around and speaking to them and getting to meet them uh, and encouraging them to pray. It's, yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah, and I'm sure that's the case in every state. And I know you get to uh, touch base with Sue. She's one of your biggest advocates for sure. That's why I say she's not shy. Um, <laughs> you know, she says that's uh, shyness is not one of her spiritual gifts. So, um, Sue, thank you so much for what you're doing here in Lancaster County, Berks County. And then you said also... Lebanon. Lebanon County. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And we need, we need prayer as well. So. And I just want to say to the women, please don't be like, please get involved with moms of prayer. I have heard from so many moms that have said, why didn't you tell me about, about this before? Um, college moms who are like, I wish I would have learned about moms in prayer before. I wish I would have known this. So if you're part of a moms in prayer group, share. If you're not yet, find us. Um, youth pastors, find us. We will pray for you. Um, that That is what we delight in, in praying for children in schools. Yes. And don't forget us here at CPYU. We need that Absolutely. as well. So uh, especially in Absolutely. these days. Yeah. I, you, yeah. you know it. You you experience, I'm sure you you folks, is the deeper you go in prayer, the more spiritual oppression you experience. And uh, like you said, the enemy um, does not like this at all. So yeah. So thank and, you. And we have you as a great resource, Walt. I mean, you're helping us know how to pray for children in schools. So we appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for your encouragement. Well, everybody, thanks for listening in. Um, it, this has been a great conversation. Again, it's Moms in Prayer International, momsinprayer.org, momsinprayer.org. And so uh, track with them. And, and if you're new to CPYU, check us out, cpyu.org. We're adding new things all the time. And I, I agree, like what Sue said, we, we talk about a lot of the stuff that's going on out there that will spark you to pray. And I'll leave you with this, that, you know, as parents, we get overwhelmed by what we see and by what we hear. And certainly when those things that are out there start to touch our kids and our kids embrace things that um, they really shouldn't be embracing, you know, I'll go back to something. Uh, Travis sparked this thought for me, and I, I say this to parents all the time, that uh, a landscape of hopelessness. And I think that's a lot of what we see in the youth culture today. A landscape of hopelessness is really a landscape of great opportunity for the gospel. And so we need to be praying for kids and parents, churches, youth groups through that. So awesome. thanks, folks, for joining Thank us. You. We will chat with you again on the next episode of Youth Culture Matters. See you then. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.